processing is that um, transformers uh, ha are something that will continue to change our, our lives uh, and become more and more important for the way we consume media, uh, I predict, uh, over even a short period of time, like a year. But in the next five years, there'll be big advances with the ways that we uh, interact with computers, the way that we interact with internet searches, and the way that uh, information is presented to us. I'm not going to digress on that, but um, we're starting with the bare basics today, and we'll continue this uh, this um, this series. And then uh, for next week, I've got the date here wrong, but um, <clears throat> oops, no, I do have the date correct. For uh, next week, we're going to uh, relaunch the boot camp. Um, this is for a number of reasons. Uh, we took the poll, and some old timers said that they would be interested in um, being mentors. And then there are quite a lot of new people always starting uh, that want to go through the boot camp, possibly even including some current students in 7041, the EBA class. Okay, and we're just going to continue that um, that cycle of those three topics. Now, after this first week of February, I've got some travel and some other engagements in February. I think I can manage to do um, something the first week, uh, the second week of February, the 8th. Uh, but then um, for the last two weeks, I think we'll take a break because I'll be traveling out of the country. OK, so without further ado, what I've got today is I'm going to introduce the topic with some slides and a notebook. Uh, which I've just noticed I've misspelled. You'll mute yourself, please. <laughs> and um, I'm going to start with the slides and we'll come to the notebook. It should be in a state that um, we can all follow along together. Okay. Get myself situated here. Going to enable editing. Yes. And uh, let's see if the full screen behaves today. And let's see if I can draw some text. And I can. We're ready to go. All right. Fantastic. <clears throat> now, uh, I've, I've based this, and I plan to continue to base this series off of a um, an Amazon Web Services, an AWS initiative called Machine Learning University. Some of the stuff is quite basic, and it overlaps at a superficial level with um, the stuff that I've covered in, um, in uh, the data science core module C7081. Some of it um, overlaps with C7082. Um, the material is, is curated pretty well, uh, and they've got for this series, a GitHub repo that's got um, Colab notebooks, and it's got uh, some some videos actually, and a YouTube channel as well. And um, in the spirit of uh, doing something interesting and um, and quickly developing it, I've adapted and plan to continue to adapt their existing material. So if you want to see the full fat version, it's there. One thing that I've done different from them is that uh, they have this um, computational system at AWS. It's got a really terrible name. It's called Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab. And that's the that's the full and correct name of it. We have to get the full and correct name because they also have uh, AWS SageMaker and they have a AWS SageMaker Studio. And both of those are different from each other and they're different from Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab. It's quite a complicated thing, but they've um, they've uh, made these materials in part, I believe, to uh, to advertise and to create a resource for educators for the Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab. But uh, even though I love it, it's a really neat resource. It's actually very difficult to use uh, in its current form. And so I've adapted these and I'll continue to adapt these materials for use on CoLab, which I find much easier. OK, so um, <clears throat> so. Uh, I have I have adapted these a little bit from the uh, existing lectures. If you want to see the full fat version and do some reading outside uh, of these, 
What we're going to do today, though, is, is just introduce the idea of, of natural language processing, introduce some jargon, and then actually do some um, some um, data prep using CoLab. Okay, so here are some uh, NLP natural language processing terms. One is um, that of the corpus. Now the corpus, just uh, make this a little bit better for people. There are a few people here watching in the class. <clears throat> there we go. Um, a corpus is just a collection of, uh, of data that are comprised of words or phrases that have meaning for the scientist. And, um, and maybe you want to extract uh, meaning from a corpus. So an example might be um, existing data sets. Uh, this is the so-called common crawl corpus. It's one of the largest sets of uh, text that um, is just the contents of uh, text on web pages. Now this is an Amazon, I believe this is an Amazon project, 5 billion web pages they claim, over 500 terabytes of uh, material. That's, you know, uh, if, if your average laptop has 500 um, megabytes uh, or gigabytes rather of, um, of storage on a, on a hard drive, usually less, um, you know, this is, let's say, much, much bigger than that. <laughs> it can fit on a laptop, so proper big data. Uh, Reddit, the website with a lot of text, there's a Reddit um, corpus that's been curated, which we may use uh, as part of this. And Wikipedia itself is a Wikipedia corpus, and, and there are many of them. What scientists use it for, what Iona, um, I can't see it, who has joined us today, but Iona may be here. I know, um, I know Iona is interested in natural language processing, and uh, Iona's uh, a corpus that researchers might be interested in would be, say, um, a collection of papers for a literature review uh, that would be uh, used to mine for meaning. So another um, kind of concept is that of the token. And within a corpus, um, tokens are, you know, a collection of wor meaningful words or phrases that you would extract from, um, from uh, the corpus or other documents that are relevant for the, the corpus. Let me give you an example for the research application. Maybe um, we're interested in, um, <clears throat> in phrases that, uh, uh, if we're interested in farming research, how, uh, what the, what the um, inclination is for farmers to be open to, say, soil regenerative activities, soil regeneration. Uh, well, we might um, define some words or phrases that we could use to search a corpus that would be a questionnaire of many, many farmers. Okay, just an example. Here's a generic example of how you would take the tokens and convert them into uh, actual data to do analysis. We have to, um, we have to convert them into some kind of um, systematic numerical um, meaning. So here we, we might take a, a series of tokens and we might um, give them weighted values in association with uh, here what we call a, a feature vector that has meaning. Okay, so for these tokens on the rows, uh, we might weight some numerical value in association with some meaning. So here, royalty, uh, king and queen would weight very high, highly. Man or woman might not rate um, very highly. Smart or intelligent um, might or might not be associated with it. So we weight the high values uh, in association like this. If we had some other feature vectors like femininity, we, we could have negative association with the phrase the token king, positive with queen, and so forth. With intelligence, um, if we had token king, queen, or man, we might have uh, some kind of um, neutral uh, or woman 
neutral um, weighting, but with the tokens uh, smart and intelligent, we might have high ranking. The numerical ranking of these is uh, of these feature vectors is arbitrary, um, but we we would probably want if we if we had a number of feature vectors like this, we'd want them to be on a common scale. So we might do something called normalization, which we might practice in the future. OK, so <clears throat> to perform uh, machine learning. I've just um, just had a conversation with some people where we're, where um, people were complaining about the term artificial intelligence AI being used for almost everything, and uh, in the context of natural language processing, we a lot of people might refer to machine learning models as AI. One of the things I wanted to say just here is that um, you know when we think of AI, we think of um, some kind of supervised learning uh, operation that could be as simple as regression. And uh, many people, if they explained regression, wouldn't consider uh, regression artificial intelligence. And yet it's a catch-all term that would encompass uh, uh, machine learning in some contexts. And so um, <clears throat> This gives a workflow that would encompass many different approaches um, for, for machine learning with text data. We'd start off with, with the data itself in some form. And th this here, this box represents raw data. So uh, for the questionnaire example, it would be the free text answers that all of those farmers gave. Or with the research example, it might be a collection of 1,000 published academic papers. Now this this at this stage would not be referred to as the corpus. This is just raw text data. Second, we have this um, text pre-processing phase where we do cleaning of the data and formatting and um, we we take out words that are very common. We call them stop words. I'll explain this a little bit more in a second. And we do some other fancy jargon stuff, stimming and limitization. And not only will I explain that in a second, but we'll actually do it um, briefly today with a with a trivial example. Second thing we do is um, we convert the pre-processed text from this step into um, a format that can be analyzed. So this is referred to as vectorization. And it, um, it takes the, uh, the catalog of, um, of words we're left with after pre-processing and it converts it in some form, um, usually to numbers that uh, can be analyzed with machine learning models. Uh, this is an unnecessary jargon term, but um, I have heard it called the bag of words, and they're calling it that in this material. And then finally, with that with that corpus that's been converted into numbers, we train our machine learning model. OK, and this is using um, using that numerical data that represents the corpus of uh, text. And uh, we can use all sorts of things here. We can use logistic regression. We can use K nearest neighbors clustering. We could use what many people would consider proper artificial intelligence like neural networks. And through the course of this, um, this set of material, we'll do, we'll do all of this stuff. And, and today, um, we'll, we'll look at literally one sentence of really fuzzy and messy text data, and we'll um, complete this step, the text pre-processing entirely today with a single sentence, OK? So it's just introducing the concepts and the tools. OK, so here's what here are like some of those terms. <clears throat> now um, we mentioned the, the word tokens or tokenization. And this is the process of uh, taking raw text and splitting it um, into smaller parts. OK. 
okay. And um, I think uh, I think this should say by removing white space and uh, and punctuation. So you might have some sentence like uh, I don't like eggs. Okay, we have an apostrophe. We have some spaces between the words and so forth. Um, and what we can do is we can tokenize that sentence into its component parts by removing the white spaces. Um, in this one, we we've picked out the the uh, word I. We've removed do for don't, so the sort of um, a verb base of don't, and we've removed the n apostrophe t, and we've separated like and eggs, and we've separated out the period. Okay, so these are the raw tokens, uh, the raw tokens. I'm not sure. Um, maybe maybe some software would separate those and be able to recognize the um, the, the base verbs. Um, but we would have to use a piece of software that would do that for us, or we'd need to set up the um, tokens and define the tokens manually. And um, we mentioned stop words. Stop words are words that don't have a, a significant contribution to, um, to meaning in the corpus. So common words, and, is, at, um, prepositions um, and uh, and other uh, figures of speech that connect language syntactically. Now these are in English, and uh, I wanted to point out here that um, you need to to define your tokens for any language that your corpus is in, and it could be any language. Not only that, let me point out that um, in English. Uh, can you imagine the proportion of research that's done in Amer so-called American English as opposed to English English? <laughs> you know, it might not be exactly the same. So these are considerations. So if we remove the stop words from the original sentence, uh, maybe the original sentence, there is a tree near the house. Without the stop words defined in this catalog of stop words, we end up with tree near house. Now listen, an interesting thing about the stop words conceptually is that we want to remove all of the, the words that do not contribute to the meaning of a set of words. There is a tree near the house, tree near house, that strips it down to the very bare basics. And that's the point of this. Um, <clears throat> So um, one of the one of the packages that that we'll we'll use as soon as a few minutes from now is called uh, NLTK. It's the Natural Language Toolkit. Um, it's got its own website. I think I give the link over. I think I remembered to put it over in the notebook as well. And um, this is like a set of the stop words that uh, you can edit this, of course. This is a set of them that are included in the default stop word library in that um, uh, NLTK library. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, me, myself, and I, uh, we, our, ours, um, if we go, that's up here at the top, we can go down to the middle, against, between, in, out, on, so prepositions, in English and uh, down here at the bottom hasn't uh, in all of its very various spellings and misspellings um, needn't shan't wouldn't and so forth okay um, the the exact words that are in your stop word removal um, tool we've got to have a little bit of thought a little bit more thought than completely thoughtless about uh, how we handle this when we remove these words from our corpus. Because um, what if, if you assume, let's say that you've got a problem and maybe the problem is um, 
a product review, or this would have equally apply to uh, the little scenario I gave with the farmers where we're, um, we're want to gauge or measure sentiment. Sentiment. And what is meant by sentiment is um, whether whether uh, someone based on the, the corpus, based on the data, whether they like something or not. And, uh, you know, maybe it's a product review. And maybe we were wanting to classify the product review as positive or negative. We want to measure sentiment. And, uh, you know, if we had a stop list that comprises all of this stuff, would it be good? Well, um, we've got lots of negative words. Shouldn't, needed, wouldn't, doesn't, didn't, should have, could have, but didn't. You know, it probably is not the best list of words if we want to answer this specific problem. So, yeah, no, we want to keep in negative words. I love this. They've included uh, the, uh, the good old Southern American ain't. Excellent. OK. Um, <clears throat> now, I, there's this other term, uh, stemming and limitizing. So stemming is um, refers to uh, words that are that can be modified from a base in some language to um, have the same meaning, but maybe verb um, tenses. OK, so playing, played, plays. So stemming is um, is a set of rules, again, language specific, probably context specific as well, that will slice a um, set of words like like these into its base and and so so um, the, the stemming refers to uh, maybe like pruning a stem down to the base the base word or the or the base stem of uh, a set of words but you know it, it's this is a simple um, a simple method and it, they're not uh, they're not stretching too far with their metaphor on the stimming. They literally um, have a rule that looks for a, a set of bases that you define and they slice off anything before or after that base. OK, and so because of that. There is a limitation to how effective stimming is um, if you have. Uh, you know, words like teach, taught, um, bring, brought that uh, have irregular forms that don't go down to a stem. So you'd have to have lots of exceptions to effectively use stimming for, for some applications. Uh, an advantage of stimming that it doesn't really say on this slide is that it's super fast and, and it's been around for a long time. Super fast doesn't really matter for, uh, say, a sample of, um, of uh, 100 or 200 surveys from some farmers, but it might be uh, if you're talking about 200 terabytes or 500 terabytes of, of data, it would make a big difference. Don't make me mute you. Who's speaking in here? Oh, Eric, there we go. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> um, and so then we get to limitization. Limitization. OK, I see some reason. That my uh, little attempt. Oh, I can't. Uh, I can't move that. I'll undo that. <clears throat> um, it's uh, this is like. Whoops. Back up to that. Discard. Let's go down to that again, and I want to fix those little things so we can make sure that we see them. Go. Big again. Now, limitization is similar to stimming, but um, it's it's essentially a smart form of uh, of stimming, and it takes a lot more setup. Luckily for us, um, a lot of people over time have set this up for American and English English, and um, they've done it for us. So it, it handles the exceptions for different forms like taught, teaching, and teaches could be uh, taken and limitized to the base verb teach. And uh, the way that it works is that, uh, you know, the due diligence for that language has been done and 
the dictionary has been created. OK, so um, an, another little addition to this is the different um, types of words associated with um, functions in speech are also identified. So it, it's kind of a big deal to set this up, um, but you don't have to do it from scratch. Tools exist. <clears throat> And uh, I think we've already gone over this, but um, <clears throat> limitization is, you know, more complex and is usually works better. We'll, you know, do a very small example of both of them today. Um, we can see the results uh, from stimming versus limitization. If we have an original sentence, the children are playing outside. The weather was better yesterday. Uh, the children are play outside. The weather was better yesterday versus limitization, the child be play outside, the weather be good yesterday. You know, it sounds um, silly, but uh, if we kind of look at the result, we can see that uh, limitization um, explicitly gets all of the meaning out of the sentence and stimming um, may not still leave some wooliness in there um, that could affect the analysis. Now I remember that I've gotten to this space and I have forgotten to put in a picture that I meant to, which was um, a brilliant picture that George sent of her dog using the laptop in our studio. But we can just ima imagine that. What's your dog's name, George? Betty. So we can imagine Betty um, tapping on the laptop in uh, our studio, but we won't be using our studio today. I thought I'd just mention here that there are a series of exercises um, associated with these. <clears throat> I have had to edit them a little bit and I've got my own version of, of them so that they work in Colab. And if you want to follow along, I believe if you, if you have used Colab before, almost every person should be able to, um, to follow along with this. Now to do it, you need a few things. You need a Google account. You need to be signed in. Uh, and you're going to need a basic understanding of using Colab. Now, we've done this quite a lot in here in the past, but since this is the first day, we have just about enough time to go really slow the first day, and I think everybody should be able to follow along with us. Uh, I'll take five minutes after we start to take questions and help people with problems, but um, <clears throat> what I could ask is if people really want to follow along is um, and we are having some problems doing so, that uh, maybe I could ask somebody who uses Colab to break off into, into rooms and to help, help others who are just starting. So if that arises, we'll do that. We'll try to figure that out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to escape from, uh, from the <clears throat> presentation and go back to our website. For people that joined laterally, I'll just drop the... Um, the um, URL for the website in the chat. So if you navigate to the website, um, I've got this section here that has the slides that we just went through and this notebook. Now, if this works, you should just be able to click on that notebook and it should just open it up in Google Colab, which it does. Sorry for the um, ridiculously large hexes, but I wrote this part uh, locally, and then I uploaded it and tested it on Colab, and the um, I wrote these in. I'm just going to edit this. I have to sign in to do this. I um, Let me see here. I think the world has gone crazy with um, two factor authentication. Oh, there we go. It didn't make me uh, authenticate. Good. I think it's doing it by Bluetooth with my phone. So I'm going to. Um, 
I'm going to allow notifications from Google because I trust Google. I'm going to double click on my um, this little section here. There we go. So I've, I've input these as um, HTML instead of as Markdown. And for some reason, Colab um, handles HTML, but I think everything else should work. <clears throat> So if we just scroll past those gigantic hex stickers, we should be OK. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so people can see. Maybe that's OK. Maybe I can do it by magnifying rather than stretching my screen. I think that works a little bit better. OK. OK, so there's a contents over here. I want to give everybody just a minute to um, to uh, get this up if you're going to follow along. If anybody needs to pause and to get started, now's the time. Let's just take two minutes to do that. I'm going to have a drink of um, something. So I'll give everybody two minutes, and if anybody needs to pause, just drop a drop a line in the chat. Okay. Can I ask uh, if you guys are watching chat? Just let me know if something comes up in chat. Okay. I don't think anybody has um, said anything in chat, so I assume you're all with me. And if anybody just needs to pause, just let us know. <clears throat> okay. Okay. All right, good. Thumbs up all around. Excellent. OK, so um, now I, I've got this set up on um, on GitHub and over here for people that are newer to Colab. Um, what we've just done is we've from from a GitHub repo that I've set up. Um, I've uploaded some some assets and today for today it's the only asset is this notebook. And it's opened it in your um, collab. You can see up here in collab that um, that I'm signed in to this collab space. I have another symbol up here on the browser Chrome, which I'm signed in to go um, Google Chrome on my Google accounts, same account. And uh, over here, we have a couple of of buttons we can look at. <clears throat> um, we can search. Uh, within our notebook, we can um, look at variables if we have a lot of them, and we can look in our our um, space. We can refresh our uh, local storage like that. No, it it um, mine says that it's got AWS NLP already in it because I had. Um, I ran it to test it not long before the meeting just to make sure some last minute changes, but I'm going to go ahead and um, uncomment this line. You, you don't need to do this. What this line will do is just to clear my um, my whole folder there. I'm going to run it anyway because I trust myself. And then let's refresh. OK, so um, this is just uh, some some code to um, delete a whole folder from a virtual space. <clears throat> now I'm going to go up here and uh, you, despite my best efforts, I couldn't collab is is just acts funny and I couldn't figure out a way to have GitHub and collab in this workflow and to make a. Um, a, um, a. Notebook that I upload that was cleared of all outputs uh, if I had run it once. I think I could set up a git ignore to do that for you git git users, uh, GitHub users out there. But instead, I'm going to go to this edit page, and I recommend you do do this. Go down to the bottom and clear all outputs. Okay. So having done those two steps, um, we want to be looking at a, a notebook. 
that's open in Colab, signed in, and there are no outputs. So we'll all be starting at exactly the same steps. I'll explain all the steps. We have 20 more minutes, and that's plenty of time to get through this. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is to um, clone the repo. Now you can go and browse through my repo. What the repo contains now, it's on the Harper Data Science Organization repo that um, that I started that hosts our web page. And I've just made a little repo called AWS NLP. And uh, the base of that is the cloned AWS machine learning uh, university for NLP. And I, I'll just edit this as it goes on so that it works in Colab and to remove extraneous things and add things that I think are important. So, but I, I haven't I haven't done any of this from scratch. This is uh, me modifying the existing pretty good code. I did have to edit it a little bit to get it to work in Colab and to update it, especially from the requirements. So the first thing we're going to do is just clone in. Uh, we do um, shift enter, as you know, to run these cells. Should clone it in. Take just a moment. There, there are some corpus um, data files in the repo. And uh, we're not going to use them today, but we will in the future. They clone in just fine. And if you've got this folder selected down here, you can um, click refresh or just close the folder, click the folder twice like I did. And now you should see the NA AWS NLP folder. So this is the just the repo. And um, it's got a few folders. There's a folder with some data. You can just kind of look at it. It's got a folder with some uh, the notebooks in it. And like I said, uh, it's got quite a lot of them, but I'll I'll re-edit new versions of them as I go through these. But if you want to see the originals, you can look here or go to the original repo. <coughs> you wish. I think I have a le link to the original repo in the README if you're curious, or you can just Google it. And then I'll I'll keep up the slides, my version of the slides and the original slides. Okay, so I'm just curating everything to maintain it. Let's just look at our present working directory. The Linux command three, two, one. So we're in the content folder. I think I was just talking to uh, Matt Butler about this, and we decided that if we go up and see the content folder, let's just click up once, is that uh, we have this, this whole mess of folders, and it's the content folder where um, we go by default. So that's where that's where we're at at the moment. We're inside that content folder as our default. Um, and now now there are some requirements. Now, if we go into the um, the root of the AWS NLP directory, there's this requirements text. You can look at them if you wish, um, but it's just uh, this uses PyTorch. I might mention for uh, if there are any data science students in here, it uses the PyTorch framework rather than TensorFlow. Uh, that that's the uh, framework that um, Facebook developed. Okay, so um, three, two, one. Let's install those requirements. Probably get a warning message here. Okay, it says uh, running pip is the is a repository of um, different files. It's one of the big ones. Conda is another one that we use regularly, um, and it says that we can mess everything up if we run pip as the root with that. Um, percent sign, but we're just going to go ahead and do it uh, in this case and ignore that warning. Um, <clears throat> I think what it explains to you is that if any of you have used Anaconda, I'm not going to linger on this for um, people that are new. We don't have to worry about it, but we can in Colab. We can set up a virtual environment within Colab, believe it or not, just like we do in Anaconda. So uh, we get this warning to tell us that if we're doing anything really ambitious, we probably should do that. We're not going to worry about that for this stuff. OK, so we're going to go through some steps and uh, simply clean some text. Now for this, I'm going to close the directory so that we can see all of the. Um, this code I'm just going to scroll back up to the first one. There we go, so. Um, uh, we're just going to do some text cleaning. Here we've got uh, 
a character string. It's all in quotes. So uh, this entire thing that I've selected is a string of characters in quotes. Now within this string, if I just click in there again, there are some quotation marks. There are some punctuation. Um, there are some there's some dead white spaces here at the beginning. There are like four spaces between the um, beginning of the character string and the first word this. Uh, and it says this is a message to be cleaned. It may involve some things like um, this, this um, less than and greater than sign uh, encompassing the, the letters BR is HTML code. So it may include some HTML code. For example, if we've gotten the text from a web page. Um, and there's a tab in here as well, or at least there's supposed to be a tab. I think this might be a tab um, before the adjacent spaces. OK, so it's got a lot of junk in here. So we're going to read in the text, put it in a, a container called text, and then we're just going to print it back out. Three, two, one. So this is just the text saying that we read it successfully. Um, what we may want to do, one of the things I didn't mention in the slides was uh, remove uh, capitals and lowercase letters and make them all uh, one case. So uh, we could we could do it either way using the higher or the lower function. So here we're applying the method lower to our text object and putting that back in text and we're going to print it again. So this should uh, convert everything to lowercase three, two, one. So we've changed that leading T, capital T. We've changed that leading I, capital I. And I think those were the only ones. Um, we can also get rid of white spaces with the strip method. OK, again, we're taking our base text using this Python syntax, uh, adding that method with a dot, the dot strip. And we're going to print that out. So this should remove uh, at least the leading white space. So the part that's there and the trailing white space that might be after that um, period. OK, so it strips out the, the flanking white spaces. I think that's what it does. Let's see. Three, two, one. OK, so it's uh, it shifted the text. There's no leading space. It shifted the text at the end. There's no trailing space. Okay. Another thing that's very common is if you're using text um, that originates from web page code, HTML code, is to strip out um, um, code within these less than and greater than signs, which is used to denote tags in HTML. So for that, we use a um, regular expressions. We could have many sessions if we wanted to just on what regular expressions are. We're not going to do that right now. What a regular expression is, is it's a series of um, of uh, tools <clears throat> that allow us to do very efficient and powerful searches in text. It's very fast as well. And it's uh, one of the core tools that is very, very powerful. Even if we're not doing natural language processing, it's a core tool in uh, in computer programming these days in general, but especially if you're dealing with any kind of text data. We're going to read in the um, RE library, regular expression library. Then we're going to um, perform a, a search for th these two symbols are wildcards. Asterisk is a symbol for everything. And the question mark is a symbol for one character. This particular regular expression um, searches for anything between the, the greater than and less than symbols. And then substitutes it. With what's between those quotes, which is nothing. And we're going to do that to our data text. OK, and it's going to put that back in the text container and print it. So what this should do is remove that HTML tag. Uh, maybe also remove the question mark. Let's see. I don't think so. Three, two, one. So it's just removed the uh, thing that was between the tag with the wildcards between the greater than and less than symbols. OK. 
Um, <clears throat> so we removed HTML. That would be optional for some kinds of data. Um, now we're going to replace punctuations, punctuation marks through the space. Um, and it, it gives us a little bit of a heads up here that in some cases we may want to keep the punctuation because it has um, information that we need. Like uh, like meaning if we're going for sentiment analysis, positive or negative sentiment. OK, so here we redundantly import the regular expressions and we'll just leave it in here because uh, you can kind of view some of the fields in here. Um, as a cookbook, a recipe that you could exploit for things that you do in the future. And in a couple of sessions, when we build up our our um, library of recipes, we'll do a small project, which should be fun. I hope it's fun. We'll do it in real time in a session, a couple of sessions from now. So um, we're going to import a new library this time called String as well, which has some tools to recognize punctuation, so string dot punctuation is a method. And um, let's just see how that works. So it should uh, remove the uh, different punctuation marks here and, and replace them with a space. So I, what I would expect, maybe even the period out here will go, this period will go, and um, probably the, um, the um, commas and um, <clears throat> other punctuation there will go. OK, three, two, one. You know, it's replaced the uh, punctuation with a space. So the entire string should be the same length and it should have those trailing spaces here, including where the period was and where all the other punctuation um, like there were. OK. And then uh, finally, <clears throat> last uh, a last step is to remove extra spaces that are redundant and in, in including tabs. Um, now a symbol for that in the regular expressions is this um, backspace s plus. So that's spaces that are single plus other forms like tab. Uh, I think you could, the thing with regular expressions is that they're notoriously hard to understand just from looking at it unless you're an expert in regular expressions. So we're just going to ignore that for now. We may come back to it if people want to. But for now, we're going to remove the extra spaces, um, apply that substring to our text document, put it, replace it in the same container name, print it out. So we should get this message with um, the extra space here removed and the big set of spaces up here removed. Three, two, one. That looks pretty, pretty good. OK, so it works pretty well. It's just a trivial example, but uh, now we've done a number of things that are fairly sophisticated, even though we've taken the, just the first steps. Imagine the leap of faith that you would have to take if you were doing this with, um, I don't know, let's say a megabyte of text that was from uh, 200 subjects in a survey. So we wouldn't be able to eyeball it to see what's going on. <clears throat> so um, what we've done, even though the example is trivial, uh, I guess my point is that it's it's very sophisticated what we've just accomplished. Now um, we're going to do some some further text processing, the uh, stemming and limitization now. And to do this, we're going to um, use the natural language toolkit, the NLTK. Remember what we get out of that. One of the things we get out of that this is that it um, <clears throat> it has uh, a a library of stop words that we can uh, we can exploit. So we're going to go ahead and uh, import the library and then download some of the little libraries, which we'll call on. Okay, so three, two, one. 
So just take a second. It's true, it's done it. Literally just took a second. Why did it go so fast? I expected it to be faster. Does anybody know why that went so fast? I expected we probably just um, downloaded 100 megabytes of stuff. Does anybody know why it went so fast? Was it because I already had it installed? No, it's because we're in the cloud and the connection between the Google servers and the storage setup for the NLTK toolset is that fast. We're probably getting 100 megabytes a second on fiber. I typically get 50 megabytes a second on um, Colab when I use it all the time. Yeah, George. Yeah, yeah, you can. It's fairly advanced. Like for even for me, I would think that's an advanced thing, but you absolutely can. It's one of the powerful things about it. The question was asked, can you make changes to say the stop word library? And yeah, you totally, totally can. And you can you can make your own library and use it instead, or you can edit one of theirs. You absolutely can, yes. Okay, so the first little thing we're gonna demonstrate is this um, stop word removal. Okay, so this is the words that are common. In fact, here's an example of using our own stop word list rather than a stock library. And we just done trivial, some of the most common words in English. Um, so to do this, we would import the NLTK library. We'd uh, use the um, word tokenize tool. That's the algorithm that, that searches very quickly. Remember, we're doing a trivial example here, but um, we, um, we, um, we, we need to use these tools because that efficiency that would come with a real large data set would be, would be required. Um, <clears throat> we're going to put a placeholder and initialize a, a, a variable called filtered sentence where we're going to put the results of our, of our uh, operation here, of our um, tokenizer uh, to remove stop words. We're going to define some stop words. So this is a custom set of stop words, <clears throat> a list of stop words. <coughs> and then we're going to tokenize it. So we're going to um, we're going to uh, apply a tokenizer to our text. Um, put that into um, a new variable called words. Then we're going to search through uh, our tokenized words and uh, test whether they're in our stop words list. Okay. Um, and then we're going to put our filtered sentence. If uh, if if we don't find our stop word in our in our list, we're going to create uh, in our new filtered sentence variable that we created up here. We're going to append one word after another to that filtered sentence. And then. Um, Finally, at the end of that, um, we're going to uh, join together the words in that list for our filtered sentence and join them together with a space. So there's a space between all of them. And then we're, it's going to print out the results. OK, so three, two, one should go real fast. It's already done. And now we're going to print it out three, two, one. OK. So. Um, we can see uh, how fast it is. We're going to do stimming now. We're going to like back to back. We're going to do limitization next. Whoops, I didn't mean to double click that. Okay, so the first example, it's going to be to do the same exact thing. First using um, stimming and then using limitization to see if, um, you know, demonstrate the difference. I have just enough time to talk through this. Uh, so we're just about out of time here. So um, we're just going to use tools from the stock library. We're going to import the library and get the word tokenize and a stimmer tool. Now, I think there are probably are a couple of versions. We're going to use one called Snowball Stimmer. We're going to initialize it with a dictionary that's uh, for generic English. Initialize our stemmed sentence. We're going to uh, tokenize it. It's a step we would go through, and then we're going to go through um, a 
a loop or loop to stem our sentence, just like we did above. Create a new list of stemmed sentences against our library of tokens of stop words. And then join it together with a space and print it out. OK, so this is a, exactly analogous. This is an automated way of doing what we just did manually. Using the uh, um, stemming tool. So three, two, one, boom, let's print it. So um, here we got some weird stuff going on. Messag be cleaned may involve with missing E something like a JSON space tab. So this is kind of a janky result that has created, it's solved some problems, but it's also created some problems <laughs> for the researcher. I, I think probably most people would not use stemming these days unless it was a very cut and dried problem. I think almost everybody would use limitization, but I think the idea of demonstrating this is just to get a concept in there. <clears throat> now, limitization is the last one. This is some more sophisticated leap of faith to use this. Again, we're using a tokenizer. Now, here we're bringing in. Um, bringing in a corpus that, remember, for limitization, we need that corpus of different word forms. So we need a dictionary, you know, a corpus to, to test that against. And we're bringing in the a limitizer tool. In this case, it's called um, the WordNet limitizer to match the corpus that we bring in. We create a... Um, <clears throat> A, um, a variable, <clears throat> WL, WordNet limitizer, I suppose. And um, looks like what we're going to do is go through and go through the dictionary um, systematically here and um, initialize our limitized system. So this just sets up the dictionary against which we're going to um, run our sentence for limitization. We're going to initialize space for that. We're going to um, set up uh, our tokenized words, just like we did above. Keep mousing over and getting the tool tips, which I don't want, don't want to do. Um, we're going to get a, set up a tool here called position tags that makes a search for a big corpus efficient. So it's efficiency and necessary efficient step that uh, uh, essentially makes a map of the locations of words that are going to be limitized. And then we're going to search through the map for our limitized tags and append just, just in the same analogous way, a limitized sentence together, and then make it into some text with spaces between the list of words, and then finally print it. Okay, so I'm gonna do it. Three, two, one, should go instant, and we're gonna print out our sentence. Remember how bad the previous one looked. You know, mess act may be clean, may involve some things like add J space tab, and it should look much better, three, two, one. Message be clean may involve something like adjacent space tabs. This is quite sophisticated, what we've just done. It's just a, a really what the purpose of this, this notebook is, is to demonstrate with an uh, example that's small enough that we can follow to actually see what's happening with the code. It's fine at this stage, if you want to um, keep on with this, that. Uh, you don't memorize or uh, maybe some of these terms aren't strong or some of the tools aren't strong in your mind because we'll practice them over and over. The thing I really like about this set of tools, about this Machine Learning University AWS resource, is that it, uh, it does go very slow and it reiterates a lot of stuff. So we have to take a bit of a leap of faith. Probably, if you're interested in this stuff, my best recommendation would be 
that before session two, a couple of weeks from now, to just refresh yourself with the slides from today, run this notebook again to refresh those concepts because we're going to hit the ground starting at this place where we've ended today. I'm going to stop the recording now. Any comments or questions? <clears throat>